Hello everyone, welcome to Scotty on the Horn. This is a podcast where I invite experts from a variety of fields and discuss topics that interest me. Today's guest is Dr. Michael Carter. He started his academic journey at Brock University where he did his undergraduate degree and master's. He then moved on to do a PhD at the University of Ottawa. He did a postdoc at Queen's University before settling in his final position at University McMaster as an assistant professor in the Department of Kinesiology. In today's episode, we talk about optimizing practice. Hopefully you enjoy. All right, we'll start getting into it now. So usually how I like to start this is get into the history of sport participation and then kind of your trajectory in school. So let's get started. Mike Carter, he's a little guy. I don't know how old you are when you start competitive sport with little bunny ears on that or quotations, competitive sport. How old are you? And what are you oh playing? God. I don't know how old I was now. Um, I was pretty young, like probably like five or six yeah. with, with like hockey. And um, I think first year I played hockey, played played house league. Mm-hmm. I had no idea like if I was going to be any good or anything like that. Following year, I played I played on the competitive team, um, like like the B team, and then uh, played at that level for a while, and then eventually made it to playing like just single A hockey yeah. for basically from that time on. Mm-hmm. Um, also played uh, played a lot of sports. Played like soccer. Played baseball. Um, what else? Golf. I mean, funny enough, I, I like a lot of the sports that that I played were like you know, parents kind of putting you into them. Like I didn't really like soccer that much. I found it kind of boring, but to me it was kind of like just being able to run around and stay in like summer shape for like hockey for the following year. It's kind yeah. of how I always looked at it. I just, it's like, it's just not, not my sport. And well, you uh, know, you know, Raph, a eh? Brazilian, I used to be in the yeah. lab with for the listeners, but I used to always call soccer hockey conditioning. Yeah. Just yeah. because I would say it's not even worth playing. It's just to be in shape for hockey for a real sport. So yeah, he didn't like that all that much. Oh <laughs> yeah, no. A and, and, little guy when he had a little little boy, I, I brought him like a hockey stick and everything. And then when Katie was born, he sent a, he sent her a Brazilian uh, jersey, <laughs> soccer nice. jersey. So well, I think part of it too is like like I'm just so not coordinated with my feet. Like, you know, like I'll watch videos of like, or I'll show videos of soccer players and lectures and stuff like that to like cover different sports. So I'm not always just focusing on, on my sports. Um, and it's, it's crazy what some people can do with it. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean, I'm just like clumsy beyond belief with my feet. Like, you know, I barely, barely, barely can walk sometimes. So you're a good skater though. You're a really good skater. I'm okay at that. I mean, I'm, I'm no, I'm no Jeff Karen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, so, but, uh, uh, well, I don't know if you were six, two, you maybe, <laughs> you know, I know. Yeah. The, I mean, that, that's, that's the thing that hurt me. You know, that five, five status doesn't, doesn't really help you in, in, in the hockey world too much. Yeah. So played hockey growing up golf. Yeah. It's actually quite a good golfer. Did you play, where did you play golf? Was it just, just for fun. I'm terrible at golf now though. I don't, I don't golf enough. I've lost all, all the consistency. Um, you you worked but, at golf courses. Yeah, I worked at golf courses. So I worked for, kind of for, for bubbling for for a few years, and uh, no, I mean, funny enough, like golf was the only sport I asked my parents to put me in. That's the only one I didn't get put in. <laughs> so, but but it's fair. Neither of my parents really liked golf, and yeah. uh, I'm pretty like I feel like I might have played one round of golf with my mom in my entire life, and yeah. maybe ten or so with my dad. It just wasn't the things that, that they liked. So once I kind of, you know, got a job and I could drive, then, you know, I was able to kind of start golfing more on my on my more, favorite more, more than I was doing before that. So my favorite is we have uh we used to go camping every year in the States for my birthday and then one of my buddies' dads found out Mike was good at <laughs> golf and then started golfing with him instead of his son. <laughs> so- <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah, golfing with Brad's dad. Yeah. Yeah. The son he never had. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. Well, that, that's actually like speaking of uh, when I was going through some of these old hard drives, trying to find some data files for uh, for a request I got for one of our papers. Um, 
I found some videos of like you early days golf and when we were teaching you how to golf. Just yeah. So I should send them to you because they'd be good for you to show in like uh, when you give a lecture on this sort of topic and you can talk about like, you know, beginning stages. Yeah. And, yeah. And was awesome. but, it, but it was, my, it was crazy God, watching it because of comparing it to um, when we played, when I came out to Lethbridge last year, yeah. just seeing your swing then versus, you know, six years ago. Mm-hmm. It's, it's pretty crazy. I've actually last round I was able to fix my slice. Like I slice hard on the driver all the time. And like yeah. what I figured was when you come up and if I sort of go around to the ball, kind of from the, like outside in, yeah. it would straighten it out. Nice. So well, I, I mean, I mean, that's kind of a helpful. Th- I, I mean, I think the nice is the biggest thing that you try to aim for with golf is this when you're standing at, on the tee and you're about to hit a shot or, or any shot for that matter is if you have some idea about what the end result is going to be, then, you know, you're probably going to play fairly, fairly good golf. It's when you stand over the ball and you're like, yeah, who knows what's where this might go to the right. This might go to the left. It might go straight. I, I don't know. Right. Yeah. That's when golf is, is, is a struggle. And, and that's kind of like what it is when you don't play too often. Right. Because you yeah. get all these weird things in your swing and then you try fixing things in the middle of a round, which is not the place to fix things. And, yeah. those sorts of stuff but uh no I, I mean golf what i've always liked about golf is it, it's it's one of these things where like i absolutely love it but i almost never have fun playing it because <laughs> it's either like i am I, I start playing i'm having a good round and and i realize i'm playing well and then all of a sudden i put all this pressure on me to like keep playing well yeah or i'm playing around and i'm playing terrible and then I'm like, ah, and I get just mad and it's just all frustrating. Yeah. But then like I finished the round, you know, my, every single time I was like, man, that was awesome. I can't wait to go back. Yeah. yeah. It's just like the, those like three and a half hours that, that I'm playing. I'm just like, it's just this mental grind sometimes. Right. Yeah. You'll, so. you'll play like crap the whole round and then you just get enough nice hits that make you want to come back. Cause you know, you can do them. Yeah. Yeah, or you have like your best hole is the 18th hole or something like that, yeah, right? Yeah. And so you have this like recent memory of like success. You're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> now I just need to do that on every single hole the next time yeah. I play, and you know the golf will be. I, I, I figured it out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> next yeah. time I'll know. Yeah. yeah. Then then you go to the next round and and you stand on that first tee and you hit and you're like, oh, here we go, here we go again. <laughs> but yeah. I think it's it, I think the challenge is is like I mean I only if I play four rounds a year now, like that's a pretty good year for me. Yeah. Like I've, like I've played twice this year. I mean, I, I know it's a pandemic, but I think yeah. I have some buddies who've played a ton of golf. Well, I know so, people who've played a lot more. Yeah. Well, that's ex- exactly right. I mean, also, you know, like, like you also a new dad. So yeah, yeah, I yeah. mean, it's, it's tough to, to get away at, at times and play. So I, I just can't wait for him to be old enough to golf yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. Then we can get a couple couple golf memberships and nice. just live at the golf course on the weekend. Yeah. Awesome. So So okay, so we've covered some your sport history here now. Let's uh let's get into school. Where'd you go to high school actually? Went to high school in uh Markham. Markham. Went to Markville Secondary School. Nice. Yeah. I think it was I think I think that's what it was called. <laughs> I think it's what it's called, yeah. <laughs> oh god. That probably tells you right there how much time I spent at the school. Yeah. But uh, um, yeah, so I went to Markville. I, I, I think that's what, why I just called it that. I should probably know what it is. My sister teaches at, at that high school now that we yeah. both went to, which is kind of interesting. So I went there. I went there because of um, for French, French immersion. Yeah. Um, and then uh, or I guess it was called French extended, I guess. I can't remember. It's something like that. Anyways. And then from there, I went to Brock University to do my undergrad. Um, and then I stayed at Brock to do my master's. What did you undergrad in? Physical education. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I mean, when I think back on it, like I didn't really, originally I didn't even want to, want to go to university. I didn't really have any plans to go to university. I, like my, my plan as like a teenager was to uh, work at Loblaws for the rest of my life. Yeah. And uh, which, like, I mean, it just as like a kid making money in high school, like it was just, it was nice. Right. And, and yeah. I didn't really particularly enjoy high school Yeah. and I didn't really think I was all that great at, at school. Um, and uh, there's a fair number of teachers, some still there that would probably agree with like that, that, that statement. But um, 
anyways, yeah, I eventually decided to apply. I was a little bit kind of sporadic with my, my applications. Like I only applied to like three universities and three different programs. So there's oh, like yeah. no consistency in like what I was thinking clearly. Uh, no. But I remember thinking like, you know, like I thought about going to university, doing phys ed to become a gym teacher. Yeah. And then to maybe try to, you know, help people not have the same experience in high school that I did. Um, and, and, and that, and so I got to university, ended up loving school for like the first time in my life. Mm. Um, we kind of realized that I was, uh, I guess I'm kind of okay at, at school, much better than what I would have predicted from, you know, high school grades. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I get clearly never really left. Yeah, yeah. But um but yeah, so did phys ed, but very early into it I realized I did not want to be a gym teacher. Yeah. And uh I, I mean and then I did the usual like, you know, flipping and flopping kind of between different things, not really sure what to do. Yeah. And then eventually it was, you know, February or March of like my fourth year <laughs> and uh of like the final semester and I'm just like, Oh, we're done like next month. Don't yeah. know what to do. And uh so I walked into uh Jay Patterson's office and was just kind of like, hey, Jay, what do you think of me about maybe being on my master's supervisor? Yeah. And we, we chatted a little bit about that and, and he agreed. And so I applied to do my master's and eventually got in. And, and I remember like when I got the acceptance being like, man, this is really cool. I now know what I'm going to do. And then all of a sudden I had this like huge, like realization of like, oh, now I got to do a thesis. I don't have no idea what I'm going to do for a thesis. Like yeah. I, I can't think of anything. <laughs> yeah. Know? Like I don't know what I'm going to do. And, and at that time, like I didn't do an undergrad thesis, like how most people do. I didn't do um, it either. Yeah. Like it wasn't, it wasn't, it's interesting. Cause like when I, at Ottawa, like where obviously we met, um, like it was marketed and promoted and, and professors like, you know, recruited students and talked to them about it. And that's how it is at McMaster for me. Um, we, you know, we'll, we'll, if we think a student might be good for it, we'll kind of email them or, you know, pull them aside and, and chat with them. And I mean, or, you know, no one really wanted to work with me as an undergrad, possibly. I wouldn't, I wouldn't blame them in, in that way. But, and so maybe that did happen at Brock, but I definitely didn't get, um, at least with my recollection, it wasn't kind of promoted in the same way it is at other universities. Yeah. So, but anyways, yeah, I ended up doing that. I got a summer grant to work in the lab. Um, and so that was like kind of my first research experience leading up to doing, starting my master's that, that, that fall semester. So was there something that made you, like, what made you think maybe a master's? Like, was there a moment? Was there a teacher? Was there a class or was it, no, or was it I, just, I don't know what I'm doing and here's a way to put a to your band I, I, on. <laughs> I think it, I think it's a, a lot of things. I think in, in some ways it was kind of like, um, I'm really enjoying school. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't mind having some control over kind of what I learned now. Um, a little bit of like, I still don't know what I want to do. This might buy me a bit of time to kind of think and, and, you know, gain some different skills. Um, and I had gotten really interested in, in motor learning. And a lot of that had to do with, with, with Jay Patterson and having him for a whole bunch of different courses and yeah. really liking the stuff that, that he was teaching. Yeah. So that had really kind of um, sparked my interest in it. Mm. And, so what uh, was your master's uh, project? Oh, my God. What was my master's project? <laughs> oh, my master's project was... Uh, so, um, so I did a... Well, I guess I have to start backwards a little bit. So um, I guess I'll start with... So one of the things why I, I picked motor learning was... Um, I remember in, in the motor learning class, third year course in, in the lab section for it, um, we were doing something on contextual interference, which is basically looking at learning that happens when you're practicing multiple skills in the same se session. So those skills kind of introduce interference amongst each other. And generally, and, and what that kind of effect shows is that when you intersperse those skills, the way that you practice them. So, you know, if you're doing skill one, then skill three, then skill two, then skill three, then skill one versus doing all your trials of skill one, then all your trials of skill two and all your trials of skill three, um, you tend, tend to learn better with that interleaved schedule. So trying to learn three skills at once, you'll learn better than one skill 
Are they well, so it's not, not so much as it's one. So let's say you have like one practice session, right? And yeah. so let's say it's like 60 trials, right? Yeah. And you do, you, you're going to do 20 of each of those skills. Yeah. You can either randomize, like the order that you do at skill on any given trial could be randomized. So you, you have no idea what you're going to do. So that's that interleaved one. Yeah. Or you could do all 20 trials of one skill, then 20 mm-hmm. trials of the next skill, and then yeah. 20 trials. And what the research shows in both motor learning, which, and it, it kind of took this from uh, the verbal learning literature, is that that random schedule or interleaf schedule is more effective for learning. It's, it's less effective for your performance during practice. So it looks like you're not improving at all, or you, sorry, you improve at a much slower rate relative to the blocked group. Within the same. Um, but when practice. you come back for, for learning, you show greater learning. Mm-hmm. So I remember learning about this in, the, in that class and, and discussing the article in the lab section before actually doing this. And it was so contrary to everything I've experienced in my entire life with sports and, and practices. Everything is very kind of this rote repetition block kind of schedules. And so I was like, there's no way that this is better. Like I just, I, I couldn't buy it, even though like you, you get told all this stuff in class. But I was just like, my experience tells me that there's no way this could be the end. Mm-hmm. And so we did this lab and, and to my amazement, it worked like yeah. random was better in this, like not really controlled setting. You don't really have somebody kind of, you know, being this experimenter or acting yeah. as this coach is really guiding it. It's just kind of, you're doing it on your own. And, and it seemed powerful enough to kind of have the, this effect happen. And it, and it just kind of blew my mind. And, and from there I was just like hooked on, on kind of motor learning and, and that yeah. sort of stuff. So but anyway, so then from there, in terms of what my master's was on, I, around that time, there was some popularity gaining in research looking at letting the learner to make decisions in their practice environment. So generally, if you're learning some skill or you, let's say, you know, you're rehabilitating an injury, you go to a physical therapist, they kind of tell you exactly what to do, right? You're going to do these exercises this many times in this order. And people were showing that if you let the learner decide, you know, when they want feedback or the order they're going to practice skills in or when they're going to observe a model that that led to better learning outcomes relative to a group of participants that were matched to someone in that choice group and replicated their schedule, but they didn't get to have that same opportunity. So So the way that I always kind of explain it is if you and I were doing this experiment, right? And you were this in this choice group with say feedback and in, you know, the first 10 trials, let's say you asked for feedback on trials one, five, and six, and I was matched to you. Well, I'm going to get feedback on trials one, five, and six, whether I wanted it or not. And so what you're doing is you're controlling for the relative timing of when that feedback is happening, yeah. Yeah. but you're, you don't have that same choice. Mm-hmm. And so people were kind of exploring this, seeing when was it, when, when was this happening? And my first exposure to doing a study with this was a directed study during my master's course where we looked at whether or not people could control their feedback schedule for learning multiple skills. Everyone up to that point had always just been a single skill. And, and, it, and we found some, some benefit for that. Um, and so, so isn't, what I, one of the, isn't one of the benefits that people, when given the choice, tend to choose more of a random schedule it, so if they are doing the the multiple skills what ends up happening is uh, generally what you end up seeing is they kind of transition so they may start off doing a little bit more kind of block like yeah. but as practice kind of continues on they basically increase this challenge on themselves without probably realizing it but they do start doing more task switching Later I'm on. feeling we'll probably go over these terms, but can you, like a bunch of times, so can you define block, serial, and random? Just because yeah, so, I, I imagine we'll probably use them a bunch. Yeah, yeah. So block practice, um, easiest way. So let's say you have the three skills, skill A, skill B, and skill C. Block practice would be, let's do all of your trials of skill A. Then you move on to all your trials of skill B, and then all your trials of skill C. And so what you have there is this practice schedule that is highly predictable and, and high, high repetitions of performing that st- same skill. Excuse me. And that could be like the one end of the continuum. At the other end of the continuum, you're going to have random practice where it's going to be interleaved. You don't know. You don't have this predictability. So it might be A 
then C, then A, then B, then C, then A. And it just kind of keeps going until you do the same number of tries for each of them. And then somewhere in the middle, you have something that's serial that kind of combines both uh, elements of blocked and elements of random. And so the elements of a block that you end up getting is this predictability. And then the elements of random is that you have this switching that's happening. So serial would be doing uh, skill A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. And so that's kind of like this middle ground between the two of them. Mm -hmm. Could it be like A, 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 B, 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 C, C, C? Yeah, you could end up doing something like that. That would be, be that would, so if you had that continuum again, yeah, and be, let's say you had this true serial, that yeah. would fall somewhere in between like that serial and that, and that random one. Yeah, yeah. Because you have this repetition of the same thing happening. Yeah. And, and so you get into these ideas of like, well, you know, obviously you need to take into account the learner that you're working with, what are like their age groups and, and, yeah. and their, their um, any sort of limitations that might come in, different constraints that might impact them, the actual tasks that they're learning, and then they're in the environment that they're in, right? So those three things are always going to come together and they may or they should impact the decisions that you make in terms of how you're going to design some sort of practice environment for whoever you're working with for learning. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so back to kind of uh, the master's work then was, uh, so there was a, a paper by Shivikowski and Wolf in 2005 that was exploring one of the reasons why this might actually be, uh, why having this choice over feedback at least, why is it more effective than not having that choice? And the idea they were exploring was that, well, if you have this choice, that like maybe you can tailor the practice to, to your own individual needs. And so what they did, and what I thought was a pretty, pretty nice um, uh, manipulation is they basically changed the timing of when that choice would be made. So you either decided if you wanted feedback for that trial before you performed, or you, yeah. would, make your, you would perform your trial and then you would to make the decision afterwards and that probably sounds really familiar to you because it's i did a replication of that in my actual phd work mm -hmm. and what they ended up finding in this experiment was that the, the group of, of choice participants that decided after the trial showed better learning on one of the measures of learning compared to the other group and so they took that as this evidence that deciding afterwards had some sort of advantage and what they kind of linked it to was this idea of they may be in gaining in, in engaging in uh, spontaneous error estimation or, or subjective performance evaluations and that may be used to decide whether or not you need feedback or not can you define so, what that is, what that means so basically when you make a movement obviously you're yeah. going to get flooded with sensory information about the outcome of that movement that it could be visual information it could be you know proprioceptive inf information from the uh, the limbs that were involved in that movement yeah. and so you you're basically going to get flooded with that information and and one of the ways to kind of feel it and for anyone who who golfs and I'm sure you figured have felt this before like sometimes you'll make a swing mm -hmm. and even before you see where the ball is you're like that was a awful yeah. swing yeah, or that felt it. really good right and so that kind of gut feeling that you end up getting may be really important for whether or not you need feedback yeah so they that was kind of like one of the big take-homes from it is that deciding after was really important um and it was the first time that it got kind of really talked about in terms of this error estimation and so that was something that i was interested in because i've always been interested in in the role of errors and the importance of making errors while learning mm -hmm. So my master's looked at um, a few things. So one was strategies. Why were people asking for feedback? Um, in these past studies, people would administer this questionnaire that said like, you know, at the end of practice, you would get this questionnaire and it said, when were you asking for feedback? Multiple choice after, mostly after perceived good trials, mostly after perceived bad trials, mostly after kind of both good and bad, random or other. And you were asked this one time for practice as a whole, which was fine. I mean, it, it gave some indications and it kind of revealed that, well, most what you would see, the majority of people were saying that they were asking for feedback after perceived good trials. And what, and while that kind of makes sense to me uh, for later stages of practice early on, like you have no sense of what a good trial is, right? Mm -hmm. That's so, odd to me because I would, if I did something well, I would think, okay, well, I don't need feedback because that was good. Yeah. And I would, I would look for something when I screw up, I go, okay, well, clearly I need some help here. 
Yeah. And, and I mean, and, and you would get people who, who would behave in that way. Right. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, the majority, yeah. and, and it's, it's a small, it's not like it's like, you know, often 80 or 90% of the participants, it would be like, you know, 50% of the participants or yeah. 45% of the participants. Or the, um, was, was the biggest this, right? group, right? Yeah. The biggest. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and so for me, my, my thing was, was, well, early on, you can't know what a good trial is. Yeah. Second, you're really exploring that, that task workspace. So you're probably using some other strategy and you're not capturing that strategy because you're only asking about practice as a whole and practice is very dynamic and it's probably going to change throughout. So the first kind of addition was we, I had them complete that questionnaire for the first and second half of practice separately. So it all, it still was administered at the very end of practice, but we asked you what strategy were you using early in practice? What one were you using later in practice? Because I, what I thought was maybe happening to some extent in, in the past studies was like a bit of a recency effect. Yeah. You get this questionnaire and it's just asking for you about practice as a whole. And so whatever was the last strategy you may have been using the most is probably the one that you were possibly reporting. So that was one of the first things that I added in. The other one I added in was some tests of error estimation. So if this is the reason why, if we ask people to actually estimate their performance during retention or transfer, so those are our two kind of two possible ways to go about looking at whether or not learning has actually happened. So in an inner standard motor learning experiment for anyone who's not in motor learning, we have generally say three main phases. So we would have a practice phase or an acquisition phase where you are going to be introduced to the skill that you need to learn and you'll be in the experimental group that you're assigned. So whatever independent variable is being kind of manipulated by the researchers, whatever level you're at for that, you're going to be practicing with it. And that you'd be calling performance, right? So yeah, so that often is, gets as called, you got better, your performance would increase. Yeah, yeah. So that everyone, I mean, everything is always mode of performance. Learning, you, you can't directly observe learning, right? You have to kind of infer learning through behavior or through performance. Well, like learning so, would be sustained performance. Yeah, and and so what we need is a way to kind of separate any sort of transient or temporary effects, which is what we kind of think is happening in practice because the impact or the influence of that independent variable is there. And so the way that we go about generally separating that is we do these retention and transfer tests. And they're usually at a minimum, ideally 24 hours um, after the practice period. So over that 24 hours, the assumption is they're not practicing this skill because often we make these kind of um, contrived skills for them to actually learn because we want everyone to kind of start from like more or less of a blank slate even though yeah. that's actually never going to be the case. But again, it's one of the assumptions, you know, that you're kind of trying to have. And yeah. it's an unfamiliar skill. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so for retention, what you end up doing is you, it, you'll do the, perform the same skill that you were practicing in the practice or re acquisition phase. But generally what you do is the two groups would do it under the common level of the independent variable. So if we use the example of the, the choice and the no choice, and that would be what happens in practice. So the choice group would be asked after every trial, let's say, do you want feedback? Yes or no. And then the yoke group, they would just get feedback according to that schedule. In retention, no one makes a choice. Everyone just gets feedback after every trial or everyone gets no feedback after any trial. And that's generally what they do is we give no feedback from an external source. So all what you can really rely on is your own internal or intrinsic feedback yeah. so information from like proprioceptors or you know vision what you see or, see or feel yeah and then a transfer test is basically looking at how well can you take whatever you learned in acquisition and generalize it to a novel context and so that could be a different skill variation it could be a different environment so what we, you can maybe do is bring in a whole bunch of people to now watch you perform some skill and that would be kind of this environmental um, transfer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I forget what, where I was going with this now. Oh, yeah, no. Yeah, I remember. And so what we had them do in retention and transfer was actually estimate their performance after every, every trial. So because they the would assumption perform, was, and then you would say, how, how good did you do? Yeah. Or how well did you yeah, do? Yeah, or how much air do you think you had? Yeah. Right? And so what we had them doing was this basically this um, force production task where they had to propel 
this little object down a railing to a certain distance. And so people would just guess what was that final distance. Um, and you could get the amount of air between whatever the goal was. And then what you could look at is what is the error in terms of their estimation? Like how, how accurate was their guess relative to what they actually did? So you're kind of ignoring the actual target and just seeing what would happen there. And then the third thing I added in was I was interested in older adults. And so we had an older adult um, manipulation. So we did younger adults and older adults. Mm -hmm. And what we ended up finding was that for the younger adults, uh, we, we showed the same kind of learning benefit from having choice. And we saw that the, the choice younger adults were also better at um, estimating their error compared to their, the, the control no choice group of the younger ad adults. We saw that the self-control group reported a change in their strategy from the first half to the second half. So early on, they were more so asking for feedback after both good and bad trials, relatively equal, they said. And that in the second half, they were more so switching towards asking for feedback after mostly good trials or perceived good trials, I should say. And then for the older adults, we basically found that they didn't really benefit from this, this opportunity to exercise choice. They created really bad feedback schedules. They were either asking for feedback all the time or mm -hmm. almost never. Yeah. They were not good at estimating their performance and they used weird strategies at, at times in terms of what they were kind of reporting. I don't remember all the details of it, but yeah. that kind of was, was the, the key thing with it. It was, well, how do you explain that? How do you try and explain that? So we explained it in the context of a few things. So one of the ones we talked about was that as you get older, obviously there's differences in kind of information processing abilities and executive functions. And, and so that may have been one of these things. So by make, re requiring them to make decisions about how to structure their practice, you may have been overloading them. Um, the other kind of one that's probably a little bit more believable when you look at their actual feedback schedules they created, for the groups that were asking for feedback, basically after every single trial, um, we know that that's actually not a good way of, 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 of providing feedback for learning in generally more simple skills. Mm -hmm. um, having some reduced relative frequency is generally viewed as being more effective. Well, so doesn't it might become have... a crutch if you yes, get feedback exactly. every time? Yeah. yeah. So if you're getting to get this, you know, really precise feedback from say a computer display or a coach, why even bother learning to pay attention to your own in own intrinsic feedback right yeah, yeah and so especially when you then put them into a retention test where there is no feedback available it's like they don't know how to use their own sensory information right and so the the, the idea is always that this retention test or transfer where there isn't going to be that feedback is a little bit more like kind of a game situation so but uh yeah have you ever yeah, so, uh, have you ever sorry, studied yeah. elite athletes or like people who are highly skilled at the task? No. I wonder what it would be because when we look at the expertise literature, what separates experts from non-experts is that experts work on weaknesses. So I wonder if they would only want feedback. Well, one, they have a lot of knowledge about, about their own performance. And then I wonder if that would translate to asking for feedback only when they made a mistake. So, um, so I've never done anything with that. Um, but, uh, there are some researchers who are, are, are interested in expertise. So, uh, Nikki Hodges, a, a professor at the university of British Columbia, they did some of this like self-controlled or, or choice, um, research using some experts. I don't remember the details of, of the study yeah. anymore, but, um, I can definitely send you the link to a link to the paper for it. Maybe I'll try and get Nikki Hodge on here. She's <laughs> got the time yeah. for me. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, but, um, but I mean, I, I mean, if I fast forward kind of all the way to, to now, right. It's speaking kind of on this instead, rather than focusing kind of on those past, um, it's, it's an interesting time for at least this choice research, because what's interesting is for the most part, in the last couple of NASPAs, so NASPA um, or last one few one of NASPAs, our main conferences. Yeah, the North American Society of Physical Activity and no, Sports Psychology and Physical Activity. I always forget what it stands for, the order of them, yeah. but uh, something like that. Um, and uh, I just always call it NASPA. But um, what's been interesting NASPA. is... 
(laughs) (laughs) What's interesting with it is people have had some challenges replicating this benefit of choice. Mm. Like there was one year where there was a whole, whole um, um, section on self-control or choice. And I think maybe actually nobody found this benefit with it. Right. And, and speaking to kind of some of our, our more, re- the work that we've been doing in my lab now at, at McMaster, we also have not really been able to find these benefits. And uh, so it's kind of been, it's been interesting. And then you have um, Brad McKay, who just finished up his PhD with Diane St. Marie, who I also did my PhD with at the University of Ottawa. Um, one of the parts of his um, dissertation is a meta-analysis that, that we've been all kind of working on, obviously he's done the majority of the work, but we started doing this meta-analysis actually while I was at the University of Ottawa and we actually have an abstract from an earlier time point with it. But then it kind of, you know, things get busy and it it took some time to kind of get everything all together. But this meta-analysis is really um, challenges the idea of whether or not actually giving choice is effective. And so kind of like we're getting ready to basically just finalize the manuscript and, and, and pre-print it and submit it for, for peer review. But kind of the take home with it is it's, it's showing that like, you can't really distinguish the effect from, from zero when you, when you kind of um, control for all these different, different factors. What do you control for? So one of the the big ones was um, publication status. So basically being published um, was kind of a, a big predictor of, uh, whether or not you know you you had the effect or not. Oh, okay. So there, yeah, yeah. There's well, that publication kind of bias yeah. for sure in the field. So, so like, those who are not researchers, uh, there's a tendency for a paper t- to get published if you show significant results. If you find no significant results, it's equally valid of a study, but it's less interesting. So the journals are less likely to publish it. Yeah, yeah, and. And one of the other things too that that came out is um, kind of a general or earlier, it would have been, I guess, 2015, I want to say, um, Matt Miller at Auburn University and Keith Lowe at who was at Auburn University at the time, but is now at um, Utah University, University of Utah or Utah University. I'm not sure the, the order of it, but um, University of Utah, University of Utah. And um they came out with a paper, a really interesting paper that kind of was like, you know, a, a, a persistent problem in motor learning studies is that they're underpowered and overworked. So we, they're generally these small samples that run a ton of statistical tests. And the, it's something that kind of always stuck with in, in my mind a, a little bit. And, and one of the things is when you go and you look at these self-control studies, you know, I, I think you know, the medium group, medi- median group size is probably like, I want to say like 12 or 15. Yeah. Maybe, maybe even lower, actually. I might, I might be being generous there. And isn't like six uh, to eight pretty common? I would say generally you're seeing people doing between 10 per group up to 15 would kind of be that range that this idea is we just need to get, you know, say 12 people per group and we yeah. should be fine. Um, and, and that's probably not the case for the design the, the designs that, that people are running with lots of tests, lots of dependent variables, lots of things often being manipulated. You often need a lot more people. Um, and uh, I mean, and, and so what we've been running are, are far larger studies um, kind of really relying on and, and planning out the design and looking at, you know, sample size calculations to get a, a better idea and, and, you know, tweaking things to, you know, maybe make a more powerful design if, if we can. But these are, we're running studies now with like 50 participants per group rather yeah. than say 10. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we're not, we're not finding these and these, these effects. And, and when we do find some stuff related to it, it looks like they're, they're quite small. And so you need a lot of people to actually find that. And I mean, for people who, who don't know is that uh, smaller samples can inflate effect sizes. Yeah. That, you know, they're, they're much noisier. The confidence interval around that effect size estimate is going to be much larger. And as you get a bigger sample size, it's going to, you know, level out and kind of be around more what, what it actually is. And, and, and yeah, and so there seems to be some odd things, things with it. And, and so like, even for me now, like I'm at a point where 
I'm not even sure if I would make the recommendation that people should be giving people choice in, in practice. It seems like it's not going to have any sort of benefit and, and you may be, you know, taking some focus away in some way from something or, or, or not giving them something else in, in its place that would be more effective. Right. Mm-hmm. So, but I, I mean, obviously people are not going to agree with me on that. I think there's people who, who definitely and genuinely think that this is an effective thing that, that people should, should be doing, but um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not so sure anymore. Yeah. So, so the people kind of, let's say on the other side of the coin to you, are they tackling it from a psych based um, grounding? Like, autonomy or basic yeah. needs is that where they're coming from basic needs theory well i mean it's so now uh, in 2016 uh kind of the the two main people uh, rebecca luthwaite and gabrielle wolf um came out with uh like uh, the optimal theory of motor learning which is optimizing performance through intrinsic motivation and attentional learning okay so sd um self-determination and, theory kind of yeah so they borrow ideas from that but but w- what they have is this idea that they're like it centers around three kind of main manipulations one is that um you know practice conditions that are going to enhance the expectancy so help with your your know perceptions of competence or self-efficacy are going to be beneficial um manipula- manipulations that are going to promote the um the learner's autonomy will be beneficial and then ones that are going to direct the learner's attention to the to more of an external focus so to the movement outcomes or the movement effects not thinking about the actual body limbs involved in in it which would be this internal focus so having this external focus so that would be the difference like i'm at a free throw line and i'm thinking internal would be i'm thinking how is my how does my elbow feel how is it aligned and then move a certain motor pattern that I'm planning yeah. versus yeah. like put your hand in the cookie jar. Right. Well, when yeah, I, I mean, you get, yes, I would be a little bit of this external, but I think that that gets into more of an, an analogy learning. Okay. Um, so uh, like a, a good one to think about would be if you were doing, let's say a um, swing a golf club. Yeah. Right. You could think about your wrists that are whole and, and hands holding the golf club, or you could, tell them things that think about the actual golf club that the head of the golf club, right. And yeah. how it's moving. Okay. And, and the key thing here is that that attentional focus is a mental focus. It's not a visual focus. So it's what you're kind of thinking about yeah. as you're, you're, you're planning that actual movement or while you're performing the actual movement. Mm-hmm. And so, for, uh, sorry, go ahead. For novices, isn't it better to look internal to start? There is, um, there'll be there. So I'm not a, a focus of attention researcher, okay. but I would say, depending on who you ask, okay. some people are going to say, yeah, you know what? You need to pay attention to some internal. Um, other people are going to say, no, it's external all the time. Okay. So I think it just depends on, on who you talk with. I think sometimes uh, when you get into that, I think you're often getting into the more, um, kind of nuanced versions of stuff. And so some people will say, well, this may not be exactly in internal focus is something slightly different or or mm-hmm. those sorts of things but it's not an area i've I spent too too much time time in. i've never done a study with attentional focus i mean yeah. the only thing for me that i find that, that i've thought about doing at times that i think would be interesting is trying to think of conditions where maybe it, it breaks down and and so what you end up seeing is um people will show that you know ex experts if they focus internally that's problematic. And so having this external focus, so, you know, if they were focusing on, you know, their tennis racket or something like that, right. That's better Mm -hmm. than thinking about their actual arm that's involved in say doing a forehand or a backhand. Um, But what's, what I've always kind of been intrigued by is you have research that shows that if you're using an implement like a tennis racket, you can kind of incorporate that into your, body representation or your body yeah. schema right and mm-hmm. so it is this natural extension of your limb yeah right and so for an expert somebody who's you know swinging a tennis racket or a golf club let's say or a hockey stick um all the time um it's like when you when you have it in your hand it's it's like part of your body yeah so in some ways 
you, you would think that telling them to focus then on that external racket to their, their oh, body would yeah. actually be an internal focus to them because when it's in their hand, it is part of that body scheme, or I would assume it would be part of their body schema. And so therefore, according to this idea, mm-hmm. you should probably break down in terms of it. To my knowledge, nobody has kind of explored that. Um, and I could be totally off the mark on whether that's actually the case or not. But it's always been kind of one of those like maybe fringe cases of like, mm-hmm. if it didn't work out, then, and, and that is in fact the case, well, then there's some stuff to kind of, you know, explore there. Because one of the, one of the issues and, and with a lot of the areas um, is I don't think we need more research showing that, hey, external is better than internal using this or doing in this group or doing this task, right? Trying to research that's really trying to understand why it's beneficial is definitely, I think, or at least for me and my bias, I find that more interesting. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's, that's very interesting, though. Thinking about the, let's say, the hockey stick as part of your body. Because I imagine you would automate that motor behavior pattern right Mm -hmm. so that it would become in the brain uh it would be a unified single signal right so you'd have myelination you'd have an actual motor pattern that is stored together that could be launched automatically kind of like breathing right where you don't have to think about it it's uh what yeah, is it? I mean, I, I, it's, it's automatic processing versus controlled processing. So then if you were to focus on the stick, that might break down the control or the automatic processing and get it into more of the controlled base, right? Yeah. And, and I mean, to kind of just hit on one thing that you kind of mentioned there is uh, this idea of like this motor pattern kind of stored and, and, and that's kind of makes me think a bit of a, like a motor program. And, uh, and so one of the things that I, I should say is not, not everyone believes in this idea of, of motor programs. So there, there are different views to kind of motor control and motor learning other than ones that are kind of more um, will invoke something like a motor program. You have more dynamical systems um, accounts to it that will, will say, you know, you're not kind of storing those, these motor programs. They're not this, this key player, this like, I guess like boss controller of this, I, 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 um, executing these actions. Instead, what you end up having is more of this bottom up um, um, emergence of behavior through kind of self organization. Whereas these motor programs are more of a, this top down kind of idea. Mm-hmm. So just as just as an aside to to kind to kind of go with it, um, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah. No, I, I, yeah, but I, I mean, I, I think there's so many interesting things that you can explore with experts and, and in that realm because it's such a unique population of individuals in terms of movers, right? Like, I mean, yeah. movement is, is such a, a, a key aspect of everyday life. You know, everything, pretty much everything you do is, is mediated through muscular contractions, right? So movement is, to quote, um, like Daniel Wolpert's, uh, pretty popular TED talk most like everything we do is really mediated um, through muscular contractions and so movement kind of is our, our main way of interacting with our environment right mm-hmm. yeah yeah so for those who might not be familiar with the term mediation it means that it is something that explains um, the relationship between a and let's say a and c right you would require b to explain the two in your your fancy mediation analysis yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah Yeah. all right so maybe maybe so what i'm going to ask you to do now is uh something that you probably don't do very often and as a researcher not that comfortable with but We'll we'll take it as it is. I'm gonna ask you to go apply it. Right? Oh yeah, there we go. Yeah. Okay. So so he's you know as a researcher, you usually stick to theories. You stick to hypotheses. Hypotheses. You you're interested in different explanatory uh, functions in the brain, but you don't necessarily try and answer these big picture problems because you lose so much control. So I'm gonna take your your information and say, listen, Mike, you you got it you 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 have it all let's let's start trying to to at least from the dr carter perspective 
how do athletes get better? So I have a novice athlete, right? Mm -hmm. They want to start practicing a skill. What would you recommend they do in terms of first, let, let's go into uh, practice schedules. So I've never played before. I want to get in and I want to get better as fast as possible. Is there a, um, are we going to put this in some sort of sport? Uh, sure. What do you want to do? You pick the sport. Um, yeah, I mean, we could go with, um, go, you want to go golf? golf. We talked about a yeah. bunch of golf. So we can yeah. stick with golf. And it's more controlled. It's a closed sport. So it's easier yeah. to understand. And, um, so I'm a novice golfer. Well, I mean, it's all right. Well, comes the court. Or the go, go, sorry. I, I, I'll correct you a little bit. So golf is a little bit open though, right? Because the wind can change, you know, so like throughout, throughout the time where you hit a shot to the next shot, right. The, the environment can change a little bit. So I wouldn't say it's a true open and it's not like a kind of true closed environment yeah, yeah. sport. It's probably somewhere a bit more in the middle. Okay. Okay. But, um, but anyways, I, that kind of, um, just <laughs> a little nitpicky. Golfers. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> just, just picking on the sports psychologists here. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, well, I mean, only my lack of, lack of concern for golf <laughs> yeah. yeah so but no I, I mean i think um there, there's a lot of things that that you can do so obviously the thing that you can't um avoid is practice right mm -hmm. you're gonna have to practice because um practice makes better um and so you're going to have to put some time time in to that now, where it gets the interesting question is, well, how can you maximize that practice time? This, this, it could be a limited resource in terms of, you know, if you're getting some lessons from somebody, you only have so much time with them and so much money that you can pay for X number of lessons, right? So you want to get the most out of them. Excuse me. So I would say probably one of the first ones, if you were going to think about kind of the actual um, um, practice scheduling so more of like learning the different types of, of shots that you might do is you're going to probably want to be a little bit more of a random schedule rather than than say blocked or anything like that and and the reason for start? why i would say this oh. is that in an actual golf game so one of the, one of the ideas that you can have is the way that you practice should to some extent reflect the way that you're going to perform in the non-practice environment so competition or actually playing the actual game and so if you go to the range and you you know hit a hit some buckets of balls and you're you hit say 15 shots with your seven iron and then you move on to the next one at no point in your actual round of golf are you going to be able are you going to hit 15 seven irons in a row yeah i mean you could if you if you're just going to hit play with your seven iron on every single shot but no but i would say no one really does that right and so what can end up happening is I, I, there's, there's a book with um, but that, that Tim Lee, who was, uh, used to be is a, an emeritus professor, I believe, at, at McMaster. I think he's on the list, or at least he should be an emeritus professor. Um, so he used to be a, a motor learning professor at McMaster University, and he has a book of motor control and everyday actions. And one of the kind of the scenarios he talks about is this idea of like, but I was great on the range before a round of golf. So you arrive to your round of golf early, you hit a bucket of balls, but you're doing exactly that, right? You're hitting a bunch of shots with a wedge, and then you move to a different club, hit a bunch of shots, and then you go to another one. And then you go to the tee and you hit your driver and it's not very good. And then your next shot's not very good. And this idea is that the way that you practice on the range is not the way that you've actually played the game. And yeah. so that potentially a more effective way would be to mix up your actual shot that you're that you're hitting on, on on the driving range or at least once you're warmed up you could even almost rehearse the the first couple holes right yeah. so on the driving range imagine what that first hole looks like hit your driver then hit what you think your next shot would be and then what your next shot would be so now you're you're starting to practice the way that you're going to actually play yeah so so I, I think for the most part, when it comes to learning multiple skills, something that is a little bit closer to, to serial or, or random, somewhere around there is probably would be my recommendation for it. 
Obviously, there are going to be some situations where block practice might be better if you're learning something really difficult, or maybe you're working with a certain population that has different, you know, motor or cognitive deficits that maybe yeah. the complexity or different, I should say difficulty associated with a random schedule may be too much. And then therefore, that's not going to be beneficial. So maybe what you actually want to do is more of a, of a transition. So you start blocked and as they kind of improve, you're going to introduce these desirable difficulties to use a term by like um, Robert Bjork um, and start to kind of increase that so that as they're improving, you're ensuring that they're still a, a, a good level of challenge so they can keep kind of getting to that next level. It's kind of like, as you mentioned earlier with experts focusing on weaknesses, right? They're trying to avoid yeah. arrested development through deliberate practice. Yeah. And I, I mean, in sports, like we always talk about having sort of a moderate to high level of difficulty. So if they're making some errors, but not too many that they yeah. feel like it's, you know, learned helplessness. So. Yeah. So and, and I mean, and I'm a very firm believer in like, you know, we learn a lot from, from, the mistakes that we make more so from sometimes our, our successes, right? There, there's information there to help reduce some uncertainties. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Well, I think there's way more valuable information when you make a mistake. Yeah. Unless the mistake is so obvious, right. Yeah. And, 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 and you know that then obviously information wouldn't be transferred in, in that situation. Mm -hmm. But I mean, one of the in, more interesting, I think manipulations in terms of scheduling is this idea of like a wind shift, lose stay. Right. So if you had some sort of performance criteria for the skill that you're doing and you meet, you met it, then yeah. you, sh then you switch or shift to the next skill variation. Yeah. If you didn't meet that performance criteria, then you could repeat it. Oh, so I was going <laughs> to, that's awesome. I wish I said this before <laughs> because then I would look smart. I was going to say, I've been thinking, and obviously I haven't read a ton on motor learning, but I was like, if I was, trying to think about you know some of the benefits between blocked serial and random practice in the sense that blocked you tend to perform better um in that one practice schedule so you will you know seem to get better in one practice right where yeah. where random you the next practice you'll be better if you practice randomly right and i was trying to tie in some of this you know some of the benefits of all all of those scheduling facets together and i thought okay well if i were coaching someone and i was going to ask you here's my strategy i think i would use i would let's say i have a, a basketball player in there and i want them to shoot from 30 different spaces around the basket right and i would have them go random so you know i'd have a one on the floor you know one to 30 and i'd do one seven nine right and as long as they make the baskets they have to move on but if they missed they would shoot until they got it. And once they got it, then they go back on the random schedule. Mm -hmm. Would that be what you're talking about? Yeah, that, that, that would get pretty close to it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. So, but again, I mean, so the, I think the really interest, interesting thing when you start thinking about the application and I mean, full disclosure, I don't think about application that, that often. It's kind of not really what I'm interested in. Um, and, uh, but I think that the challenge is, is so we know if you put somebody into random practice, it looks like they're not learning, you yeah. know, they, they struggle, they make mistakes. Whereas if you put somebody in block practice, they look great. They look like, you know, they get to this certain kind of plateau much quicker. Um, if you even, um, you know, you often ask people like which, how would you want to practice, right? They would, they generally would say they would prefer to practice in, excuse me, in, in more of a block style. Um, mm -hmm. But anyways, the, the, the challenge is how do you convince a coach? So let's say I decided I wanted to start consulting, right? Yeah. And I'm going to go to some coach and say, hey, listen, I could help your team get better by using some information we know from motor learning. How do you go about convincing a coach who's maybe, let's say if they're a professional coach, their job performance is you need to be winning games and, and all that sort of stuff. How do you convince a coach to say, I'm going to make your team better, but we're going to make them look really bad during practice. Like they're not actually learning the stuff that we want them to be learning. But yeah. trust me when they come back in the game later this week, they're going to be better. 
Yeah. Right. So how do you sell that? That's a, that's a pretty hard sell, right? Because what is, first of all, what you have is this kind of appeal to tradition, yeah. right? Yeah. This is how it's always been done and um, it works. Right. The, the, I think that the important thing is if you are in the, what the research would show as a, le, um, a less effective form of practice, those people are still learning the skill. They're just learning yeah. it to a different, um, a lower degree than say the group in the more effective one. Right. It's not like they just, I mean, there are some conditions where people don't learn anything, mm -hmm. but often there are some times where it's just like, yeah, they, they still learn. It's right? kind of like people who ask, or who get confused with uh, weightlifting, right? Anybody who goes to the gym and lifts weight, even if they're doing it in a really, really bad way, is going to put on muscle, is going to get more fit, is going to get stronger, right? But that yeah. doesn't necessarily mean it's the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and that's exactly it, right? Like, so one of the ways you can think about it is um, from like this practice condition perspective, is a bit of a zero sum game, right? in that any time that you're spent in a less effective form of practice is almost like this double loss in time, right? Because it's time that could have been spent in a more effective one. Yeah. So, um, but it, it's a hard sell, right? How do you convince somebody to, that we know that there's this thing, this learning performance distinction or this performance learning paradox, if you want to call it that, you know, just because you look like you're not learning a skill during practice doesn't mean you aren't learning it. And just because you're performing really, really well, doesn't mean that you are actually learning it. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and so there is an interesting study by Simon Bjork with contextual interference. Um, I can, I can share the paper with you if you, if you want, but where they did people doing this. So they looked at metacognition and motor learning. And what they, the, the metacognitive measure that they used was this judgment of learning. And so what they had participants actually do was basically at different time points, they would say, you know, how well do you think you, you would perform on these skills if you came back tomorrow and you had to perform them? And they would make these judgments. And what you ended up seeing is that the participants in the block group reported these very high judgments in terms of how well they were learning. Random was much lower, which would make sense because... Yeah. That's what they're experiencing during practice, right? And so the interesting one came before they did the retention test. They asked them right ahead of time, how well do you think you're going to perform on this test, right? And that kind of um, pattern stayed. The block group still estimated pretty high. It was very similar to where they were judging their, their learning at the end of practice. And same with the random group. And when you look at the graph, the difference between where the block people thought they were to where they actually were was was quite different the random group was a little bit closer yeah. and so what you have again even at the learner right is the we as humans when we're learning a skill we think that our immediate performance is a valid index of how well we're actually learning something yeah and this is why this i mean i i you i i I, I teach this um, in in my motor learning class and i kind of always contextualize with the students where i say this, if you take this into more of like a cognitive learning, so like studying for an exam, right? This is kind of hard, pretty tough. Like how, when you're studying for exam, what do you do? You know, you, you review some material, you repeat it a bunch of times. And then when you often repeat it perfectly to however you want it to be, you move on to the next one, right? Yeah. But that just because you got to that point doesn't mean you actually know it or you understand it. It could be that temporary, you know, uh, um, influence at, at play there. So, yeah. so yeah, so I, I think that's a really good connection to studying That's yeah. because it's the, the worst thing you can do is just say it over and over and over and then you get a hundred and then you go, Oh, I know it. So then you don't come back to it. Yep. So you actually don't retain it. Yeah. 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 And, and, and so, yeah, so I, I mean, I think something that's interesting is when you kind of start to introspect on the, the things that learners are thinking about as they're actually learning. Right. And so, mm -hmm during my PhD SI project that, that we did is we, we looked at some feedback stuff where you could give feedback. People would perform six trials and you give them feedback on their, their three worst trials in that block or their three best trials in that block. And, uh, and what we ended up doing is we took, we did this, that metacognition measurement. We asked people to do judgments of learning, right? Because one of the ideas is 
people would people have shown so um, um, that if you are in that kind of normal setup, that getting feedback after those three um, trials that are your relatively good trials rather than your three relatively poor trials, that you generally learn better. And I remember reading that being like, well, I wonder if that's impacting possibly these judgments of learning, right? Like, do you get this inflated sense if you're getting feedback that's always kind of like your best trials, right? So that error is always low. And so would you judge your learning to be much higher than what it actually is? Because when you look at those actual papers, um, where they are, where they reach performance and where it actually is in retention or transfer, it's quite low. So they usually use this um, point system, which is problematic in, in, as a way of measuring performance. So they're using this 1D um, error, this one dimensional kind of scoring system for a two dimensional task. So there's all sorts of problems with that. And, and there have been some papers that have talked about that. And it's something that as a field and people doing research using these tasks that they need to be a little bit more cognizant of, in my opinion. And I think us as a field needs to not be so accepting of publishing these papers because yeah. people can show that there are problems with, with measuring behavior that way. But that's outside of, 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 of what I was getting at here. And, and yeah, and so if there is still this really low performance, but you think that you're really good at something, right? And, and your performance is quite low. And so if the way you perceive your learning doesn't really match on, you can think of situations where that could be a bit of a problem, right? If you think you're really good at something and you decide to step up, but your skill level isn't there, you, there could be some bad consequences, right? You could, you know, lose the big game for your team yeah. or let's say something, you know, not so sport based, but maybe it's like CPR skills, right? If you overestimate how good you are at giving CPR, yeah. right? You could end up causing more damage than, than actually helping. Right. Yeah. So having a good balance between how good you are, how, how good you think you are at stuff and how good you actually are is, is somewhat important. And so in this study, we basically did that manipulation how people make judgments. I mean, first of all, we didn't replicate the benefit of feedback after relatively good trials, mm -hmm. but what we found and then what was interesting is that even though there is no difference between these two groups, um, they reported that, or the people who received feedback after the relatively good trials had much higher judgments of learning relative to the other group. Yeah. So, so you, even though they didn't learn more, they thought they did. Yeah. Did you ever do a measure of congruency? A measure of what? Sorry, that kind of cut out there. Oh, congruency. So group them in terms of those who were close in their estimation, regardless of whether they did poor or... Mm. No, did not do that. Mm. No. So it's stuck with simple. I mean, and even when I say there's no difference between the groups, obviously that's just not, they're not, they weren't statistically different. And if you really want to say that they're like the same, obviously you need to run like equivalence tests yeah, yeah. And, and all these yeah. sorts of things, which is some stuff that we're getting into now whenever we end up in a situation where we don't have differences. So we want to actually, you know, test for equivalence. So yeah. we, we will do these equivalence tests now as a way of kind of strengthening our um, inferences. Mm -hmm. But, um, but yeah, I, I mean, it's, yeah, there's something else I was thinking of as we we're doing, as we we're talking about this, but I don't remember exactly now. Um, but no, yeah, I, I guess circling back to, back to kind of your, your initial question, uh, what would the learner actually do? Well, I mean, yeah. So I would say that in terms of, of scheduling, I think, you know, somewhere serial random or this wind shift lose state, something that kind of is similar to that. In terms of feedback, obviously you want to give them um, feedback that isn't all the time. So that was the second one I was going to get you to, uh, to dive into is feedback schedules. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I guess the, 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 the main take home message often is uh, when you're giving feedback for the most part, schedules that are, not giving feedback all the time are better than, than schedules that have feedback after say every single trial. Now, obviously there's different conditions where, you know, 
that maybe you need to have more feedback because you need to supplement a, you know, sensory motor system that has some sort of deficit. So like say Parkinson's disease or maybe yeah, even yeah, aging, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but is it, in, is it always the, the case or is there a tapering effect? Like, would you want to have a bunch of feedback at the start and then slowly withdrawing the feedback? Yeah, yeah no, no. Yeah. So that, that is, um, probably one of the gold standard ways of scheduling feedback is that is this faded schedule. So your overall relative frequency would be say something maybe like 50% or 60% or something like that. Mm -hmm. But what you're doing is maybe in the very beginning, you're getting feedback after every single trial. And then maybe it's after every, you know, fifth trial or third trial. And then it's maybe every, um, you know, eighth trial or however, however you're going to schedule it out. Right. Yeah. So what you're doing is earlier on, you're giving that feedback to help guide the, them towards, you know, a appropriate kind of solution to the, the, the mo to the motor problem, which is the task that they're, they're trying to learn. But then you're, you're starting to fade that so they don't become dependent on it. And so they can start learning how to um, interpret their own sensory information. Mm -hmm. And then when it gets further on, and it's even fewer than, you know, you having to start relying on it even more, right? So in that kind of middle stage, you can start trying to um, refine it in some ways. So you might have your own subjective evaluation, you get yeah. some feedback, and you can kind of start tweaking, you know, your assessment, see whether or not you're kind of on that right track with it. Yeah. So, if But I'm there's so many ways, there's so many ways that you can schedule um, feedback. I mean, and, and it, and it changed with all sorts of stuff. So probably one of my favorite papers I read in my master's is a paper by Guadagnoli and Cole in 2002, 2001. And, and they, they did in this study is they had this force production task and they had different levels of two kind of variables that they manipulated. So they manipulated feedback frequency. So you either got a hundred percent feedback or 20% feedback and you either did error estimation after every single trial or no error estimation. And so you had ended up with four different groups and what they ended up showing. And, and what I loved about this experiment was, is they actually showed that the, the, the best learning happened in the group that got hundred percent feedback with hundred percent error estimation. And so what that got me, what got me excited about that is, is that there's all these situations where, you know, you can take something that is known or thought of as being this ineffective way of practicing and maybe make it better by adding in something that is beneficial. And so in this situation, what you have is that if you are being explicitly told to pay attention to your sensory information, well, that can help overcome that dependence, right? So you make your guess then you're given feedback and what it's they actually like it's, it's almost like it's feedback on their guess, not feedback on their performance. Well, it's feedback on the performance, right? Is what they get, but you also get that feedback on it, right? Because you can see what did I, did I, was my guess too large relative to what I actually did. Yeah, yeah. Right. So it can help you to start refining this. Yeah. This but error that, that's what I'm saying. Like, I think yeah. the improvements probably coming from is the, is that they're getting information about uh, their ability to guess. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I, yeah. That, that would be, be one of the, the things definitely getting, getting improved for sure. Like you're teaching so. them how to guess more effectively, whether they did well on their own versus becoming the crutch. You're actually, teaching them to not need you at all. Yeah. So what, yeah, you're teaching them to basically with, with the crutch is that you, you're never learning to interpret your own kind of response produced feedback. Right. Yeah. And in this one, you're learning and you're becoming better at it through kind of this, that, that feedback that, that you're getting about it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, but what it also showed is that the, um, it's not just all about error estimating, right? So if you have people error estimate after every single trial, but they're only getting 20% relative feedback, um, you don't get the same sort of learning outcomes. And so just error estimating on its own isn't of any sort of value unless you're going to get feedback on that performance for exactly the reasons kind of that, that you're talking at, right? To mm -hmm. help refine this this mechanism related to error detection and correction. Okay. So I wonder the take home here would be, you know, be cautious about providing too much feedback, 
But yeah. if you're going to provide a lot of feedback, make sure that you make them estimate how well they did first. Yeah. 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 I, so I, I think, I think the, the, the big take home message is you want to provide feedback in a way that it's going to help the learner learn to use their own intrinsic feedback sources because yes. in a game situation it that information is always available to them yes. right like if you think in hockey where there is multiple players on each team out there plays could be you know happening in, in the in the corner and then all of a sudden it quickly changes and you're still in the corner and and something happened and you come to the bench well the coach's attention can only really be in one place and so yeah. if you came to the bench he may not have seen something so he can't provide any sort of information to you mm. or you know or and and that means that if you want to improve well then you're going to have to rely on yourself right yeah so in all those situations you're not going to be able to in increase kind of your proficiency unless you know how to start kind of assessing performance on on your own yeah so that's kind of the, the the big big take home. Yeah, yeah. All right. So I I got you. I got some applied take home here. So now I'm wondering. I asked you before. I'm a rookie. I'm trying. I'm learning a new task. You said, "Hey, you should still do more of a random scheduling where I'm not just doing one task at a time." Feedback should probably start being frequent at the start with the athlete, and then taper off as they get more skilled. Yep. And then if you're going to provide feedback, you should see if they can, you know, get the athlete to, to reflect themselves first and then give feedback based on that or about that as well. Yep. Okay. So what about an expert? If you're thinking now on what you know about motor learning, if I go in and now I suddenly get the trust of the, uh, the pronghorns basketball team, right? So at my university, they're far better basketball players than I am. Uh, I come in, but I say, listen, I've been speaking with this expert in le motor learning. I want to make your team better at shooting. I'd probably say you should probably find a motor learning person that, that studies more applied stuff because <laughs> probably have more information that's valuable. Yeah, but I'm giving you carte blanche here, right? I know, I know, I know, I know you, yeah, and 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 I mean, and that's kind of my, uh, I, yeah, I'd be like, I'm not the person for that job. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't even tell you the like. I honestly, can't so they're an expert. Know. They would probably so let's break it down. I, like they would probably have, uh, have a large degree of error detection. Yeah. I would imagine. Well, I, I think I think where where you're probably gonna go at is the type of feedback that they're going to be looking at, right? So if we talk about external feedback that can be given to a learner, we can basically kind of have two broad categories. We can have knowledge of results, which is like feedback about the outcome of your movement relative to a um, well, feedback about the outcome of your action relative to the task goal. Yeah. So like, did you make or a basket or not? Yeah. Or you can have um, knowledge of performance, which is feedback about the characteristics that led to a performance outcome. Yeah. And that's the type of feedback that is probably more often what people learning skills are going to want. Because in, in more real sporting situations, knowledge of results feedback is usually always available to you. You can see the outcome, right? Yeah. So in the lab, you know, we study, say, knowledge of results because it's easy. And so we basically eliminate vision or something like that from the yeah. learner, right? Uh, and so you kind of make it really important for learning the task. And, and you have this assumption that you're studying the process and that that process would probably relate for how knowledge of performance would be used as well. Yeah. So, so yeah. So, I mean, and in some situations you see some similarities and, and in other ones you see that it operates in, in some different ways. Mm -hmm. And what you, what you can also sometimes get at though, too, is sometimes what you see is the, um, if you, if you are manipulating knowledge of performance, you might start measuring say movement form and seeing, you know, is your form good relative to some sort of standardized, you know, throwing scale or, yeah. or something like that. Yeah. And generally what you are, 
generally what, what you find in there is knowledge of performance is going to help improve that movement form, but it doesn't always actually lead to better performance outcomes. Yeah. Right. And so I think the in, an interesting applied question there is, well, is that really valuable yeah. in a sport that it's always more outcome based? Yeah, yeah. Right. So there's a, like a, I don't remember all the details of the actual side. I think it was more about like um, feedback that was, would induce an external focus versus an internal focus. And it was with soccer throw-ins mm-hmm. and uh, there was, I think a frequency manipulation in it as well. But um, what you, what you would see is that the group that had like the um, yeah, there was a frequency manipulation. So you, what you had was higher, higher frequency, but it was like external feedback in terms of like the, the movement, the soccer throw in form yeah. um, was better for learning the form, but there was actually no difference in terms of being more accurate with the actual target. Right. Yeah. And so I remember thinking, well, okay, like that's interesting that, you know, you had this impact on the throwing form, but as long as you're not violating the, the rules in terms of, of the soccer throw in, the most important thing is that you hit your target. Yeah. Right. So who cares if your throw looks a little bit uglier than somebody else's, mm-hmm. but if you can consistently hit that outcome, then, you yeah. know, I think that that's more important. Right. And well, so I think I the think- problem too, is that we don't know the perfect, like we think we know the perfect form. Like let, let's even look at hockey example here, right? Skating. We always thought skating, you should finish a full stride, right? For so long, you have to finish your full stride to be a good fast skater, right? Long, full, fully extended, kick out, you know, flick your toe, here we go, right? Um, but then you look at Connor McDavid, and he never finishes a stride. He goes quick, crossovers over and over and over again. And for so long, that would be told, that's a bad skating process, right? But he's the fastest guy in the world. Didn't he, didn't he lose the fastest skater in the last one? Well, yeah, but... <laughs> Maybe, maybe it's because he's not keeping his blades on the ice long enough. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. okay, but he's the second fastest. And he's the fastest with the puck by far. Yeah. So, oh, no, yeah, no. He, yeah. He's, he's a fast skater. Yeah. Yeah. No. yeah. But, but, but yeah. his mechanics and like his explosion's insane, right? So, so well, by, I think by, that's the other thing, too, right? Is I, again, I guess this is an interesting, I guess this is something inter- Maybe there are some applied questions that actually interest me. Um, but is is the goal to try to get somebody to adopt some sort of movement pattern that is considered the gold standard. So mm-hmm. like for years, like when like you think prime tiger woods, people were trying to mimic his swing, right? Or would it be better to try to work with the natural kind of swing that somebody has and go from there? And that's probably for me, probably what I would imagine is, is the right way to go about doing it. Because again, yes, you know, you want to move in a way that it is the most, you know, energy efficient, you don't want to be expending energy that you don't need to. Um, and you also don't want to move in a way that might increase your risk of injury. Yeah. Um, but for some things, it's going to obviously be more about the outcome. So if something is more outcome defined, then that's all that really matters, right? So if you think if you're working with, say, someone who's, who has had a stroke, right? And, you know, they need to brush their teeth or they need to, you know, tie their shoes or something. They may use some, some combination of movements that look not very smooth or um, as, you know, as nice as somebody who didn't have a stroke. But if it gets the job done... yeah that's that's kind of more more important i think right and and i mean you look at it like nowadays you can see golfers with all sorts of different types of swings right like the new kind of interesting swing on the pj tour is is matthew wolf's swing um before that i mean you had like jim furyk's swing that that was fairly unique so but again does this you, not tie you, back into knowledge or results though well it, how, how how are you thinking so I'm, I'm thinking, because I think you, you were saying like knowledge of process is probably better. Sorry, not, well, knowledge of performance. So in most sporting situations, oh, the feedback yeah. you get is usually going to be 
about the movement characteristics. Yeah. Right. Like if you and I are working on, on your golf swing, right. And we're on the driving range. Oh yeah. You, Cause that would be the feedback you would get. Right. And, and you would hit a shot. Yeah. You could see where it went. You could see if it went to the right or yeah, if yeah, it yeah, went yeah. straight. Right. What you may not know is some, some more say maybe biomechanical information that led to that performance yeah. outcome. Yeah. Right. So, you know, were your hips really open or yeah. your, you know, was your, did you kind of cast in terms of your actual yeah, 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 yeah. sorts of things, so, so, right? Yeah. Because again, I was forgetting that the athlete knows their performance. They see it. Therefore, yeah. that's the, let's say in a research terminology, that's the dependent variable. So what you want to know is gain that information with it thing that caused it the in independent variable right so that makes sense yeah mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and and so I, I imagine that's kind of what you're going to get in but but like i feel like it's yeah it's it's i mean i'm, I'm trying to think back about kind of you know the way you situated your question in terms of these expert people but um, i mean i've never worked with experts I also, so, I also realized I made an assumption that these experts are, are probably using block practice and they probably aren't. Like, I bet you, you would go to most practices, even at a high level. And well, maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe I'll check out a basketball practice one day, but I wouldn't be. So, so I think, I think there are more people aware of the benefits of random practice nowadays. Yeah. Um, I mean, you have books that are being written by, you know, uh, or edited by, say, sports psychologists. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're getting some motor learning people writing yeah. book chapters for them on things like observation learning, um, you know, the practice, practice scheduling, feedback, all those sorts of things. And so you're starting to see people realizing that, you, you I mean, I mean, we've chatted about this before where like, you know, you hear stories about the history of say like SCAPS, another conference that we go to that when it was really small, there wasn't this separation of motor learning and control and sport psychology and exercise psychology and all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. that, you know, every people just were interested in, in these different questions and it wasn't, didn't really matter. It was kind of all kind of one area, yeah. but then questions started getting a little bit more specialized and now you have these different areas starting to to kind of emerge and now you have like this conference for all of us that we go to but there's some isolation yeah when you're going into the different sessions that yeah, yeah. you know things aren't kind of bridging and, and probably needing a bit more conversations about these sorts of things mm -hmm. so yeah so when it comes to practicing i guess we've covered uh we've covered quite a bit anything else that we're missing that's important for let's say an athlete or a coach to know talked about practice schedule we talked about feedback schedules i mean we talked about knowledge of results yeah i mean there's so many different things that that you could you can think about in terms of stuff i mean one other one is like observation like if you're going to watch models what type of model should you should you watch yeah i've read some um, interesting stuff too where they would uh the model could be, well, is it someone else or are you watching a video of yourself? And then yep. there was even where they would break down videos and only show your best performances and whether that was more effective. Yeah. So you could do like this feed forward modeling where uh, like a self self feed forward modeling where basically have somebody do a routine that you can break down into different sections and just do each component on its own. And yeah. then you could, you know, edit the video together to make it look like you were doing it. Right? Yeah, you had a perfect swing. Yeah. And so then you could end up having that as it. You can look at things like, I mean, your, your main one is kind of looking at like, say, like a, a novice model or an expert no model or a, or a learning model. So someone who starts off really bad, but you can see them get better. Yeah. Um, or you can look at doing things like mixing them. So you could even get into like combining the observation schedule with ideas of like, do you randomize it? Do you block yeah. it? Do you transition it? Maybe Excuse me, do you do side by side comparisons? Yeah. And correct so, me if I'm wrong, but if you're using a model, you actually don't want to use like the, say I'm working with a, 
with a novice athlete. I wouldn't want to show an example of a professional athlete. I think it depends on what you're, what you're trying to achieve with them. Right. Um, so what an, an expert model is, is helpful for is um, showing you like a, a good blueprint of what the skill should look like in, yeah. in some ways, right. Or what, what, what you might want to try to achieve to do or, or those sorts of stuff. Um, a learning model um, has been shown to be mostly effective if you also have the feedback that they're receiving that's helping them to get better. Um, so you have without that information, watch someone you have, perform and then listen to the feedback they receive. Yeah, because if they're getting better and you don't know what that feedback is, you have no idea what they were doing for, for, for exploring in that. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you don't want that vicarious feedback. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah. And, but I, I think, I think the, um, I think kind of one of the big things that people have been working with, at least the last time that I, I remember, I mean, I, I used to know a little bit more about the observation of the learning world because of um, working with Diane for my PhD. And that's kind of like, you know, her, her area of expertise is ob- observational learning. Mm-hmm. Um, I do remember when some people in the lab were, were doing that for their graduate work, reading papers that were looking at these mixed models of approaches in terms of combining them in some different ways and, and seeing this, this additive benefit of, of those sorts of stuff. Um, but yeah, but I mean, I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't dive into the yeah, yeah. Um, observational learning, like kind of just for the sake of it per se, because yeah. Because of, again, because I'm not, I don't really do that, yeah. you know, consulting or, or think about the applied yeah. nature of it. Yeah, yeah. I'm mostly very I like your typical kind of, I guess, researcher in the small little bubble of knowledge and, and working and, and, mm-hmm. those sorts of, and I mean, I'm also in the process of kind of transitioning to very different kind of research areas as my interests have changed. So, so what are you, what are you working on now? Uh, so we just, so, I mean, to kind of finish to round out some, some, I guess, lingering questions with the choice stuff. Um, we just kind of finished our last uh, experiment just before the pandemic started, which was kind of nice. So we're just Mm -hmm. writing those, those papers up. So I I can give a bit of an overview of them. Um, the first one that we did was, uh, looking at the two different kind of explanations that are kind of available for it. So we got, um, Generally, people kind of invoke two different explanations. One is kind of more of this information processing one, and one is more motivational. Um, and the idea is that when you give people choice from this motivational one, that you know you're getting this this benefit to these basic psychological needs of so borrowing from self determination theory. So things like autonomy, support, they they say um, that it can help enhance their expectant expectancies for performance. So you you might also get in, increases in self efficacy. And this has a positive impact on intrinsic motivation. You get better goal action coupling and therefore, you know, you get better motor performance and better motor learning. On the other hand, you, you have this more information processing view that kind of talks about when you give people control, they can engage in these performance contingent strategies that can help to reduce any sort of uncertainty about their performance. Yeah. Um, and, and so there's this, this kind of more emphasis on these strategies that maybe people are, are adopting. Um, and so I think one of the big differences between them is that from the more motivational view, the, the benefits really arise out of this choice opportunity. Mm-hmm. And so for me, one of the kind of the fundamental things with that then is if you have groups with, with multiple groups that are exercising this choice, you really shouldn't see differences between them because they're having this choice opportunity. And so yeah. all those positive benefits should be at play for both those groups. Yeah. And so what we did in this experiment was we, is we manipulated the feedback characteristics of the schedules that participants were receiving or controlling. And so what you had is participants receiving error-based feedback. So basically like you're told the exact amount you were off the target from. Yeah. Um, we gave graded feedback. So you would be told too slow, too fast, or yeah. too far, or too short. And then in the follow-up experiment, we did binary feedback. So you're just told hit or miss. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so now you have those. So you're manipulating different... the quality of information. Exactly. Right. And so what you would get from this is, is the prediction would be that excuse me, from the information processing view, these feedback characteristics would actually matter. Yeah. 
And from the more motivational view, they, they shouldn't matter as much because people are still able to exercise choice, right? And so in the first experiment, we didn't really find um, any reliable differences between the um, uh, self-control and the no choice groups, the choice groups and the, and the choice and the no choice groups. So we didn't replicate. Okay, so you did do that. You had a, so like a six group design. So we had four groups in the experiment one and then two groups in experiment two. So, but you had choice, no choice by the th three. Yeah. So in experiment one, we have choice and no choice. Yeah. And then we, and the, the, we have two levels of feedback. And each one of those get. Yeah. So we had four yeah, groups in perfect. experiment one. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Sorry. I should be better at explaining nice my own design. research. Yeah. And, uh, and so what you ended up seeing is we don't, we didn't replicate the self-control benefit. We didn't see that. Mm -hmm. um, we, we really only saw kind of effects for, um, for feedback mm -hmm. um, characteristics in, in terms of, of that, where uh, for some elements, you would see a, a, a benefit for one and, and not the other. So not anything really super clean in that. But as a whole, for the most part, what you ended up seeing was that the feedback characteristics didn't matter. And so when we ran this equivalence test, we got um, things that were, we got, we basically conclusions were, were things that were, were inconclusive yeah. that um, you couldn't kind of claim these sorts of things with it. Um, but when we ran the follow-up study with the binary feedback, so we would have choice and no choice, and it was only binary feedback that you got. Mm -hmm. What was interesting there is that you, the people didn't even get better. They didn't improve during practice at all it's it, like it is a fairly straight line when you yeah. graph that and it stays that way kind of in retention and transfer wow and and so i mean and that shouldn't be too surprising where you know you get into this um uh period where like unless you're right on that target right you're not going to get told anything and so i mean you can learn from binary feedback but what you're going to need is a lot longer practice versus say kind of graded feedback or um, error-based feedback. Um, but our interesting findings came more so in the questionnaire data. And so in this, in this one study was, was one of the only times up to this point where we actually found an effect for um, perceived autonomy. Oh, okay. It was very, very small though. Yeah. And it required 40 people per group, I think, in order to, to see it. Um, but again, that effect was very, very, it just reached significance, mm -hmm. um, in terms of that magic threshold, but the effect size with it is quite small. Yeah. Um, but you also are not getting differences again in these other measures that, that people would expect mm -hmm. to, to have there. Right. So, um, so yeah, so not, not the, not the cleanest of studies, but there's some stuff there. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other one that, that we finished up, which I thought was kind of an interesting manipulation, was this idea that choice is a, this autonomy supportive practice. I've always had an issue with, with it because, um, first of all, no one really tested it. And whenever we did test it, you didn't really find support for that claim. So it was kind of like, we're going to call it this. It, it just felt like we're calling it this because it fits with all this other stuff and we want it to be this, you know, self-determination theory. type. So there was the assumption stuff. that providing yeah. choice made people feel more autonomous. Yeah. And that and, assumption was never tested. No. And when it was, it didn't really kind of hold up well, but the other idea is I think that it's somewhat naive is the idea that if you give somebody choice over one feature, like their feedback or their practice schedule, that that one choice is yeah. going to be so powerful yeah. that it's going to shoot them over this kind of threshold of being this autonomy supportive is a little bit crazy where if you think you're doing a task where you're doing throwing, right? Yeah. Whether I got to choose, you know, the color of the bean bag that I'm throwing, that is a manipulation that has been done in some studies or, you know, the feedback of it, I'm still able in the no choice group over that variable, make decisions about my throwing technique. Maybe yeah. I'm going to throw with a little bit more force this time. Maybe I'm going to change the way that I'm standing. Maybe I'm going to, you know, all these sorts of stuff or. Yeah, you have an infinite amount of choices. Exactly. Right. And, and so that was one of the reasons why maybe we weren't seeing these differences in the studies that we were running is that it's just, we're not 
actually affecting autonomy in any way because the actual the control group the no choice group they're not told they're denied anything right yeah. we lead them to believe that they're just getting a schedule that is predetermined so from their perspective it should just be viewed as random yeah. so what we decided to do is tell a group that's awesome that a bunch of participants came in and they got to make this decision over yeah. over you know whatever it was yeah and now you're going to practice with this schedule that's very that's awesome so in this study so this was a collaboration with keith Bloss. um we uh did um we had three groups and so what they were controlling in this one is the viewing of a model and this then they could also decide so there was do you want to watch a model yes or no and then if they said yes they could decide if they wanted to watch it in real time or in slow motion and so we just added that extra decision to try to make more decisions and then to also try to um uh make it just make it more salient to the to the group of participants in the no choice group um and uh and and then we had um the self-control group that made that decision. And then we had two yoke groups. So we had the traditional yoke group that we just told, here's a predetermined thing that they were matched to a self-control participant and they replicated right. everything. And then we had this explicit yoke group where we said, this schedule was, somebody else was in here learning this cup stacking task, which is what everyone learned. Um, they got to decide before every trial if they wanted to watch a model. And then if they decided to, they could also decide about the speed they want to watch you're now going to learn the same skill and you're going to practice with the observation schedule that they created. Yeah. That's so smart from a design perspective. That's yeah, awesome. I, I mean, it felt, it felt, it was one of the studies I was like, this is probably one of the smarter kind of That's simple awesome, no. designs that, yeah. that so I, would that you, that would you stuff. find that's so yeah. good though? Cause you have, oh, yeah. Design. So, wise, I'm, so here's the um, study where what you really are hoping to show is this, group that is being explicitly told you know you're being denied these choices yeah, yeah. they should report lower perceived autonomy yeah they didn't <laughs> <laughs> right so so there, there's a couple things there right either you know either was, our manipulation yeah. failed right yeah. is one of the possibilities yeah. or again it kind of comes back to is there's still enough opportunities mm. for them to make decisions that when we ask them questions like you know do you feel like you were able to exercise or express yeah. your opinions during practice and these sorts of things yeah um that they still feel like they're able to actually do those sorts yeah, yeah. of stuff and did you find but performance differences none we found that we, we got nothing nice in, in so again, that's, a, that's again, the perfect it was a failure to replicate the main self-control benefit right so we yeah. ran these two really large studies that failed to replicate this benefit right and, yeah. and so in in a bigger picture to me it it kind of speaks to this need for um you know not really if i mean going back to all your 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 applied based questions if we're going to make applied based recommendations that should yeah. be evidence-based we we need to probably be doing it based on maybe experiments with with stronger designs um, again, the motor learning, um, people, I mean, not everyone would fall into this, but there are, uh, there are people who are doing, you know, studies that are, are much, much better in terms of being well-powered, mm -hmm. um, running different, you know, analyses that are a bit more powerful, reducing the amount of analyses that they're actually doing, um, to try to kind of get at these things, getting into things like pre-registering. Yeah. Design, pre their I was going to say, are, are people are doing pre registered reports or just being more open, making their data available for during peer review, right? That is a huge one. When, if I review a paper and the data is available and I can go through their R code and rerun their analysis, analyses and reproduce it or calculate, you know, means and standard deviations and effect sizes if they haven't reported them, that is so useful, right? Yeah. Um, when that stuff is not available, it makes it a little bit more difficult, right? Mm -hmm. And, and I think the idea is also for um, having a little bit more, um, I guess, reservations about recommendations, right? So if you run this one study and it kind of shows this, yeah. you know, not like saying, hey, this is how we should go about doing it now. Yeah, right? I like found this one experiment, therefore right? it like, is. Yeah. That doesn't mean that this is the way that it is. It could be that one-off situation. Yeah. It could be, you know, something that's happening. And, 
and and so yeah i i think you know uh, uh, it the motor learning the at least motor skill learning um world would benefit from you know, some greater transparency and and and, and open science practices yeah i, I mean, think we all I, would. yeah I, I mean i highly encourage anyone who isn't to be to join stork which is the society for transparency and openness and replication in kinesiology they've been doing these great you know summer series lectures and these sorts of stuff they have two journal article uh, uh, journals that you can actually submit to um, one is registered reports in kinesiology and another one is communications in kinesiology so there's some other outlets for it um, for people publishing their work but um, in terms of kind of the research that, that we're get, I'm getting into and more interested in now is actually um, looking at people learning together so looking at motor interactions and so um, looking at kind of, I mean, it, it still kind of stays in this realm of decision making and and errors. And mm-hmm. so, like the the example I would kind of give is if you and I were learning a task together, right? And you know, we had some sort of redundant control over what we're we're doing, and we don't succeed at the task. Well, you you have this assignment problem, right? Like, what is the source of of, of the error? Was it you? Was it me? It was a combination of the two. Yeah. And, and that's a, that presents a bit of a computational problem that needs to be resolved in some way. And the way that you go about assigning the source of error is going to impact the decision and the way you're going to behave on that next trial. Yeah. Right. So you can kind of start. So, so there's some, one of my PhD students is, is doing some work with that for, for her dissertation work. And we're doing it in collaboration with um, uh, Josh Cashback at the university of Delaware. Um, we also have some other ones that are going to start looking at like, you know, it in terms of reinforcement learning and different kind of like, almost like games, like, like, like motor game versions of different things to kind of see, excuse me, how are people, you know, learning in these different contexts? Awesome. Awesome. So I like to kind of finish off, ask you to tell me who's doing good work right now. So it doesn't even have to be in motor learning, but who, who in research is doing, you know, interesting stuff that you're liking right now? Um, oh man, that's, uh, there's, there's so many, there's so many things um, like that you can choose. I mean, so if I stick in kind of the practice conditions world, um, I think that, uh, Matt Miller and Keith Lowe's are doing really interesting stuff. Um, there's been, uh, Jeff Fairbrothers group has had some interesting papers come out, um, recently as well in terms of, um, conditions of practice. Again, some of this some of this work involves um, choice. So mm-hmm. again, it's kind of like thinking of the the whole picture with some of the worst research we've done in the meta analysis. Um, you know, not so um, sure about you know the reliability of that being beneficial, but they've they've designed some interesting studies for sure and have yeah. found some things. Um, Matt, and, I mean, what I really like about Matt and Keith's work and and it. it and seeing their work while I was a PhD student has kind of informed some of the practices that I've adopted, like the open science practices and pre-registration. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, they, they engage in those sorts of things. Um, it's, it's nice when you read one of their papers and then you can just go to, there's a link to where their data is and you can kind of look at their data and, yeah. and, and all that sort of stuff. I mean, I, I think my um, current collaborator, Josh Cashback has done some really interesting reinforcement learning work. Um, there is uh who else is there i mean in terms of i mean you got uh, i mean you're on fire i usually get one <laughs> yeah i i mean there's just it, 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 there's there's so many there's just so many in- interesting yeah, yeah. interesting things right like yeah. it's just it's endless right there's there's yeah. there's so so much so and then uh i guess the last question for you so i kind of prompted you before but if you had one book so people have a week off you want to recommend a book, academic or not? What would you suggest they read? Um, so mostly, uh, yeah, I definitely pretty much only read nonfiction. I kind of feel guilty if I'm not learning something. That's actually most of my podcast guests and myself do. I never read a fiction book. But, yeah. yeah, I I mean, I used to read fiction all the time, but now, like, like I like I would go down and I would sit and try to read one. And I'd be like, oh, I should probably read a journal article instead. Yeah. So then to get around that, like I would read these books. Um, 
So I would say probably one of the, one of my favorite books I read when I was um, a PhD student, I think I must have read it when I was a PhD student, was uh, the, uh, the Myth of Mirror Neurons. It was a really interesting book. Um, uh, I can't remember the name of the person who wrote it now off the top of my head. I'll look it up. Gregory yeah. something. Gregory. I can't remember. Um, the book I'm reading right now, I just started reading is Science Fictions by Stuart Ritchie. Um, how fraud, bias, negligence, and hype undermine the search for truth. So I would recommend that book. I'm, I j- just am one chapter in and I find it really good so far. Nice. So yeah, that would be probably one. I mean, there's a, I, w- I wish you would have told me that this question was coming. I can't think <laughs> of uh, I can't think of a bunch of books off the top of my head. I'm trying to like in picture my, my bookshelf right now upstairs and like yeah. what book would there. Well, it's funny <laughs> because like, as an academic, I find I just force myself and, and I still don't read nonfiction, but, and I'm mostly in behavioral psychology, so I'm not in my own domain, but it applies and I can steal ideas, but, um, but I don't read very much outside of work. And I almost, for a long time, I thought of it kind of like all I do, well, a lot of what I do is read. So when I come home, the last thing I want to do is read, right? But then I've yeah. actually I've actually gotten more into it now when I take stuff that doesn't directly apply. Yeah, and and I would say that like my my nonfiction reading for the most part is often things that are like I mean like I have some math books I have um, like some physics books like so I'm generally kind of reading outside of my realm a little bit. Yeah. Um, well, actually, a lot of a lot outside of my my realm, um, but uh, but I, I think part of it too, like my reading is, like I used to read a lot more in terms of outside of journal articles, um, mm-hmm. and then that kind of stopped for a little bit, um, but it's definitely going back up again because uh, my partner Laura, she she reads like, she reads a ton of books, yeah, and like reads so I wish I could read as fast as she does, like if I could read as quickly as she does, like could consume so much more knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. But, uh, and maybe actually keep up with like all the papers that are always coming out. Yeah. 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 Nice. So. Well, uh, it was awesome. Thanks for taking the, uh, taking the time to chat. You know, I know what it's like to have a newborn and a little baby at home. So taking two, two and a half hours, three hours to chat with me. Is, oh, uh, well, I mean, the, the the good part is being able to do it once he once he once he was in bed. 